Earth is an active planet. Volcanic eruptions, erosion, continental shifts, and meteoric assaults constantly rework the planet's surface. Four point six billion years ago, the Earth was a lifeless boil of hot magma. Meteorites striking the planet brought rocks and more energy, raising the surface temperature to eighteen hundred degrees Fahrenheit. The meteoric iron pulled to the Earth's center by gravity helped build the iron core. Surrounded by the molten mantle, the unstable crust broke into huge plates thousands of miles wide. A trip to Western Australia helps identify some of the oldest land masses on Earth. These bits and pieces of ancient crust are unlikely survivors of a cycle of formation and destruction. The vertical stripes date back some 3.8 billion years, marking the time the Earth began to cool and oceans began to form. No one knows exactly how inanimate compounds became the earliest forms of life, but it happened at about this time. It happened in the sea, and it changed the history of Earth. In an effort to understand what early life might have looked like. Scientists like Princeton microbiologist Telus Anstat study certain living organisms. Extremophiles are unusual colonies of bacteria that thrive in the same sort of extreme conditions that may have existed three billion years ago. Anstat digs 200 feet below the surface to find them. Now these are living bacteria. And they live at temperatures approaching the boiling point of water. They live at pressures that are 100 times the atmosphere. They live in a salty, briny solution that's alkaline and contains gases that are toxic to us. And yet they still manage to survive. Extremophiles could have survived on Earth with no oxygen, but no other organisms could. So how did the oxygen-loving creatures that dominate the planet today arrive? The red sedimentary rocks in Australia's Karangini offer clues. The red comes from iron oxide formed when dissolved iron in the ocean combined with oxygen and formed a compound most familiar to us as rust. The huge amount of iron oxide here leaves little doubt that living organisms in the ocean were excreting oxygen. Enough of these bacteria were at work to fill the atmosphere over time with oxygen as a byproduct of their photosynthesis. With an atmosphere full of oxygen and an ozone layer screening out harmful ultraviolet light from the sun, the land became as hospitable as the ocean. After eons, life existed in both environments. Life arose early in our planet's history, and today, Earth is the only planet in our solar system capable of supporting it as we know it. Geologic forces build and destroy the staging areas, but life reacts and carries on. Every year, visitors from all over the world travel to Yellowstone National Park to see some of nature's most spectacular sights. One of the most popular is Old Faithful. Mysterious and grand, the world's tallest geyser spouts water more than 120 feet into the air. Named for its predictability, Old Faithful erupts about every 90 minutes. Although Old Faithful is a major attraction, visitors can also witness boiling mud pots, steam events, and gigantic hot springs that formed over a hundred thousand years ago. These sites are thermal features and they are part of the geological forces that have been shaping the Earth since its origin. 
Around two million years ago, a massive volcano erupted and left behind a caldera that occupies much of Yellowstone and provides the perfect setting for its thermal features. When a volcano explodes, the molten rock or magma is removed from under the volcano. Eventually, the earth collapses and forms a huge depression called a caldera. Like the one in Yellowstone, calderas are active volcanic features with magma still flowing beneath them. It is this magma along with the water and rock that cause thermal features like Old Faithful to erupt. Magma moves through the ground while water seeps down through cracks and fissures from rain and melting snow. When the two meet, very high pressures begin to build from the water that has become superheated. The third ingredient is a rock called rhyolite, which makes up the thermal feature. This rock is strong enough to contain the high pressures without breaking apart. In most geysers, it has formed a very narrow passage that brings pressures even higher. In 1993, geologist Jim Westfall sent a camera down the vent of Old Faithful to see for himself. He guides our journey. And here we go, down the vent. And you can see it's still a slot down as far as we can see so far. It's really quite a narrow slot, just a few inches wide. You also see occasionally drops of water falling down. Uh, you will see those as we go along. Uh, that's uh, water that's condensing from the steam in the vent on our cool housing. Uh, those drops are very convenient actually because they tell us which way straight down, which we otherwise wouldn't know. And now you can see we seem to be coming to kind of a shelf-like structure and uh, we worry about whether we're going to land on that and not get off of it. And we bang into the surface of it and kind of uh, bang up and down a little and aha, we go over the edge, which is very nice. Looks like a tornado now and again as it twists the camera, spins the camera around on the end of its cable. Uh, we really became very concerned whether our cameras could survive all of this. It certainly wasn't made with that in mind never had any idea that we were going to be involved in anything so wild as this. Throughout Yellowstone, visitors can see more than 10,000 thermal features releasing their pressures and heat in the form of boiling mud, hot springs, steam vents, or spouting geysers like Old Faithful. Geologists estimate that in Yellowstone, the Earth's crust may only be 40 miles thick. This is a long way down, but in most places on our planet, the crust is around 90 miles thick, more than double that. Geologists are certain that one day the magma in Yellowstone will emerge in a gigantic explosion. The question is when. For now, we can examine thermal features like those in Yellowstone to help us learn about the Earth's past and investigate clues into its future. The forces within the Earth are powerful enough to twist, turn, and juggle the planet's crust, including land masses and the sea floor. The theory that explains just how Earth's forces move large segments of the crust around is called plate tectonics. Under the Earth's crust is the mantle, a mass of hot, liquid material. As the mantle circulates, the crust, divided into enormous plates, slides around. The crust moves in response to swirling masses of magma. Land is pulled apart, shoved together, and reshaped. 250 million years ago, the plates jammed together and formed a supercontinent called Pangaea, meaning all land. But this huge continent began to pull apart, and over millions of years, it split. Some 65 million years ago, our modern continents began to take shape. One look at the shorelines of Africa and South America makes it easy to imagine these continental pieces as a whole. More evidence for continental drift can be picked up and carried away. And here's just the piece of evidence that I need. Professor Michael Rampino takes a piece of hard volcanic basalt from Argentina across the Atlantic Ocean 
to the world's most ancient desert in the South African country of Namibia. I've traveled more than 4,000 miles, and the rocks are exactly the same. They're basalt, and the age is 135 million years. But the best evidence for continental drift may be that it's still at work reshaping the globe. Like land, the ocean floor changes too. The Atlantic Ocean owes its very existence to a split between the modern continents of Africa and the Americas. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, marking the boundary between two tectonic plates, is pulling apart and shoving the continents apart at a rate of about an inch a year. But four miles beneath the surface of the ocean, this geological hotspot goes largely unnoticed. On the surface, hot molten rock boiling up in the cracks between plates creates volcanoes. The red dots on this modern map represent volcanic activity around the globe. Each volcanic lineup marks boundaries between tectonic plates. The consequences of volcanic activity can be devastating to life on the land, but it also creates much of the land on which life evolves. In 1963, 10 billion square feet of lava produced this island off the coast of Iceland in a matter of days. When tectonic plates collide, mountains may be shoved up in the process. The Himalayas, Earth's youngest and tallest mountain range, grew from sea level to a height of five miles over 30 million years. As a result of plate movements, world geography changes slowly but constantly. Volcanoes and earthquakes are just the most obvious reminders of the constant boil and rumble beneath our feet. A dive into a blue hole on Grand Bahama Island in the Caribbean gives us a portrait of the forces of erosion and deposition changing existing landforms and creating new ones all over the earth. Microbiologist Stephanie Schwab swims in search of geological history. Deposits in this cathedral-like room close to the cave's entrance are the first sign that this place has changed dramatically. It used to be dry. Deeper into the cave, divers swim through a mixing zone where seawater combines with fresh water flowing in from the land, creating a shimmer. This mix is corrosive, and the water erodes away the once solid limestone walls of the cave.
Further into one of the world's longest cave systems, Dr. Schwab uncovers fossilized bat droppings. These deposits are evidence of a time when the cave was dry and bats roosted in its ceiling hollows. There are even deposits from the world's largest desert in this underwater cave. From North Africa, winds blow telltale red dust from the Sahara. These clumps were deposited when the cave was dry. The rock formations are deposits that also help explain the dramatic change in sea level. On a human scale, this landscape seems unchanging. But a close look reminds us that geological forces are always at work reshaping the Earth. At the end of the Cretaceous period some 65 million years ago, much of life on Earth was doomed to extinction. But why? Perhaps you've heard the theory most scientists accept as plausible. A huge meteorite, six miles wide and weighing a billion pounds, slammed into Earth, leaving a crater the size of Delaware in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. One strong piece of evidence supports this theory. Iridium has been discovered in a layer of clay virtually circling the globe. It shouldn't be here. Iridium is rare on Earth and common in, you guessed it, meteorites. And the layer and the crater all date back, conveniently, about 65 million years. So the theory that a gigantic meteor hit holds up. But did the impact cause the widespread extinction of life? Searching for clues, one paleontologist, Kirk Johnson, has wandered North Dakota's badlands collecting plants. He's gathered 30,000 fossilized specimens to date. The dinosaurs are sexy, there's no question about that, but they're quite rare and they're a lot of work. Fossil leaves tell you a real different story, they give you the context. I mean, if you look at the world today, it's a green planet and plants cover the surface of the earth. Plants are living in environments and responding to them, so you can learn quite a bit from the world from looking at the plants. You look at this leaf, for instance, it's got a smooth margin, an elongate pointed tip, and that's the kind of leaf you find today in tropical rainforests, areas that have a lot of rainfall and ample temperatures. They don't get too cold in the winter, and there's always water around. It's really different than what it is here today. Many scientists have looked at such evidence and concluded that the mass extinction in the late Cretaceous period came about because the meteorite's impact clouded the Earth and left it dark and bitterly cold. But there are some contradictory clues up north. 
University of California's Bill Clemens found a host of dinosaur bones in Alaska's far north, where it was colder and darker than in tropical climates. So at least these cold adapted dinosaurs should have survived. But actually, the opposite occurs. Dinosaurs become extinct, turtles and crocodiles survive, which tells us then that it wasn't extreme cold or extreme darkness that caused the extinction of these beasts. If it wasn't extreme cold or extreme darkness that killed off the dinosaurs, perhaps it was the opposite. Maybe the meteorite smashed billions of tons of bedrock and released enough carbon dioxide to trap heat and make the planet too hot for most species. One thing is clear. We wouldn't be here if the dinosaurs were still around. After mass extinctions, survivors seem to have a new lease on life. With the destruction of dominant competitors and predators, different species flourish. Small mammals nibbled at the edges of a world dominated by dinosaurs for 75 million years. But when the dinosaurs died out, mammals multiplied and diversified. Birds also evolved from ancient reptiles and flourished. The dinosaur disaster turned out to be a lucky break for the ancestors of modern species.